right, can you hear me out there? No, no I said, can you hear me out there? Yeah. Odd Salon, let me hear you say amen. amen. Louder, say amen. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good. All right, let me try another little experiment on you. Let's see how many of you guys catch the tempo of this thing, and when you do, go ahead and snap or clap along. Doom, tock, dot, doom, tock, doom, tock, tock, doom, tock. Doom, talk, talk, doom, talk. Great. Okay. Is that enough of a stretch? All right. So I'm here to talk to you about slain is uh, the strange phenomenon of spirit possession. Now, what we what we just did was an experiment with rhythm and frequency, and what we're going to be talking about a little bit here is entrainment. So, tuck in, muggles. Um, Spirit, pos spirit possession is debunkable. Faith is debunkable. So what I'm going to ask you for the purposes of this particular talk is to um, look at the phenomenon with me through the lens of pr uh, practices and traditions as opposed to hard science. Certainly we can talk about the placebo effect, autosuggestion, hypnosis, but what I really want you to see is how this phenomenon is used in a variety of backgrounds. So if it seems weird to you, just remember the words of Marcel. And let's get started. So what's spirit possession? Well, the simple answer is uh, it is a phenomenon within the homo sapien animal that can be triggered a number of different ways and it, uh, it can trigger an ecstatic state, the intention of which is designed to create an, uh, a contact between a spiritual presence and the physical body. Um, it's practiced all over the world. It's one of the oldest religious practices there is. It's got its roots in ancient Africa, but people, both Orthodox and pagan, practice it in a variety of ways. Um, there's two main reasons why people seek out this phenomenon. One is healing, and the other one is divination. Um, just make sure I'm on the right slide here. Um, healing, uh, for example, can be things like experiencing unitive prayer, or a sort of a an absence of the body and a direct contact with the Godhead. It can involve spiritual renewal or healing around a specific emotional or physical trauma. It can also be a great form of catharsis, and some people just do it to receive a blessing. Um, in divination, the purpose of possession is a little bit more specific. It's designed to seek advice or insight from a spiritual source, whether it's uh, God, the ancestors, pagan deities, what have you. Um, this picture here, for example, is the Ni Chung Oracle from the Tibetan Buddhist lineage. Now that monk's job is to have the spirit of the oracle come into his body and take control of it for a while. And there's video of this on YouTube where he runs around huffing and puffing and eventually sits down with the Dalai Lama who asks him a series of questions about where the government is supposed to go in the next year. And they take this stuff very seriously. He's the state oracle of Tibet. So when I say this is practiced everywhere, this is one of the little surprises in this talk is I didn't know just how much everywhere really applied. I, th I sort of thought of typical places like Africa, the Caribbean, New Orleans. So um, how do you do it? Well, as near as I can figure it, it has to do with a little bit of what we were doing earlier. It is a specific combination of rhythm and frequency. And uh, it can be done a number of different ways, but those two factors can essentially cause the brain to go into a state of entrainment. And among people who are um, acculturated to this type of practice, it's pretty effective stuff and it can be pretty dramatic in its results. Um, the way it is experienced by people is unique to the subject. It's the, it goes a lot of different ways and I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, the other big thing, uh, besides rhythm and frequency, frankly, is acculturation. In other words, you kind of have to believe it for it to work. And this is where I get into that territory of, is it placebo, auto-suggestion, or something deeper? And the truth is, we don't really know, no. We have some good guesses, but um, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of it, how it affects people and how it gets put to use. So there are sort of three phases to the phenomenon. There's a phase during which the person goes from normal waking, lucid consciousness, to a state of possession, and that's the establishment phase. After that, there is a possession state that goes on for a period of time, and then it gives way to a reintegration state where the person comes back to lucid consciousness. The establishment state is probably the weirdest part about this, and I just want to acknowledge, this is weird business by any measure. It's weird to me, it's weird to a lot of other people, and I think that's part of the reason it's so controversial. But anyway, so you can see here, there's people laid out flat, there's people um, 
giving, uh, losing their balance here and being held up by others. Um, what happens in the initial, the establishment state of possession is things like convulsions, rigidity, loss of balance, and people go into kind of a fugue state. During possession, one of the big things that can happen is extreme uncharacteristic behavior. Extreme facial expressions, loud exclamations, uh, heavy breathing, stupor, even putting on certain ceremonial clothing that's set aside for specific deities and speaking uh, as an oracle. And then in the third state, the reintegration state, people generally get very tired, sometimes very hungry, like Constantine, um, and they get, uh, in many cases, a bit amnesiac. In other words, they don't completely clearly remember what it is that took place during the possession state. So I'm gonna test the audio here and see if it works, and if it does, I want you to pay attention to the sound of the Nichung Oracle's breath. He's in a state of possession about to come out, and I want you to pay attention to the frequency and the, the sound quality of his breath. <laughs> Y'all hear that? That pshht, pshht, pshht. So I measured that on an EQ. That's a mid-range frequency, and it can be used for a variety of ways, in a variety of ways to stimulate the human brain. If you've ever had your uh, skin shiver when you listen to music, it's a similar kind of a thing, but much more specific and directed against a cultural background. So in this next clip, I'm gonna show you the same kind of a thing, and what's happening is this is a Christian setting in which the minister is in a state of possession, or what's called anointing by the Holy Spirit, and he is provoking one of his parishioners into that same state, and the man he's uh, attempting to provoke into possession is starting to breathe in that same way, and it looks like this. One of the other very strange ways that uh, spirit possession phenomena can occur is that people can start uh, reacting by speaking in tongues or speaking in glossolalia, which is not an actual language, but considered to be a spiritual language that speaks directly to the Godhead, and it sounds something like this. <laughs> Now, in other cases, some people will be in a state of possession where they speak in tongues as well as speaking uh, as a medium or in an oracular way, where they're passing information from a spiritual presence on to the people that they're speaking to, in the case of this couple here. And uh, I think his advice to them is funny. If you didn't catch it, he said, you don't laugh enough. And they do. Between you and me, they look kind of stiff. I think maybe they do. <laughs> and that is literally one of the most common ways that the spirit possession phenomenon is actually put to use. Basic advice. Being confronted by something that you respect enough that they can tell you something you don't really want to hear and you'll listen and do something about it. That is fundamentally what's going on in the background of all this. Um, in another practice, there's a woman named Mother Dupree who takes her parishioners by the hand, and uh, like I said, this phenomenon is pretty unique to the subject, so people react in a number of different ways. Some people are quiet. Oh! Hey! Yes. You'll also notice she's gone rigid in that way I described earlier. Over she goes. For some people, it's very sudden. Now, some people react in very extreme ways, and I think this is another one of the ways in which this phenomenon really disturbs the untrained eye. Um, this woman is in a state of both uh, seizure-like convulsion as well as speaking in tongues. So she's sort of hooting. It looks really strange. She's basically uh, expressing glossolalia, having been touched by Mother Dupree. <laughs> And some people are just completely overwhelmed. I 
think editing that clip at night, by the way, is why my neighbors probably think I worship the devil. Or... <laughs> um, so uh, I want you to think in each of these clips also be aware of the sound quality and the frequency. You'll notice there's music, rhythm, back talk, uh, call and response. In this next clip, you'll see the minister uh, just uh, expresses a laugh, but it is in that mid-range frequency, and this is what happens. The other thing that's funny about spirit possession, in a community of people for whom this is a common practice, it can start to work a little bit like popcorn. In other words, one person can experience the state and then touch another person and have them go into it as well. So in this next clip, um, the central action is the man in the front row, but I also want you to look at the body language of the minister, the man in the front row, and pay attention to the bottom right and what happens to the people around the minister. Grand slam. So, as you can see, it's expressed a number of different ways. Some people laugh at it while it's happening. Some people find it very sober, some uh, very, very somber. Um, but it's, uh, it's uh, what can I say? It's very widespread, it's very unusual, and it's just compelling to see in uh, practically any setting you can find. So just to be a good odd Solani, I decided to give it a shot. This is me in New Orleans, Louisiana, with my colleague Blue at a ceremony that's held on Bayou St. John every year for Marie Laveau. And basically about 50 or 100 people show up, sometimes WGNO does a little story on the news. And um, they do this for the public so that people who are curious can come and observe it. Now I started observing about 20 years ago because it was just too weird and I had to check it out. So I've always been an observer, but I never signed up with anybody for any kind of serious study or training, um, I'm not exactly an orthodox uh, practitioner or anything, just a guy who's done a lot of reading and finds it interesting. So here's what happened to me. Basically, I was listening to the drummers, and the drummers are playing Haitian polyrhythms, which anybody who listens to jazz will tell you are enough to get you into sort of a trance-like state just on their own. Just like shamanic drumming, rhythm will get the brain to entrain, and that puts you in a very suggestible state. Coupled with a cultural background where this is your religious practice, it can be pretty strong indeed. And um, the other thing that I experienced was that I noticed that this singer here put his voice into a pitch and a timbre that was very mid-range heavy, and it sounded like this. It's kind of an irritating sound to hear, but the thing is that it caused a funny sensation in my body. As I was listening to the polyrhythms, and his voice started to hit that pitch more and more, I began to experience a buzzing sensation in the back of my neck, like somebody was blowing on it or tugging on it. And after about five minutes of that, I entered into a dissociative state where I felt like I was somewhere between drunk, euphoric, very tired, and maybe tripping. Um, I became aware that there were people around me surrounding me with their hands out to prevent me from hurting myself. And I, the last thing I remember thinking was, I think the thing is happening. Um, and with, without going into a, a monologue about it, basically an ex, a, a period of time passed of about 45 minutes or, or an hour during which I don't really remember much, but I know that I was given cigars and a pair of sunglasses. I know that a few people asked me for advice, and I remember it the way you might remember something that happened at the far end of a hallway. After a while, one of the priests came up to me with a handful of Florida water and slapped it on the back of my neck, and I immediately came back into a very normal, lucid state of consciousness. Um, if you want to smell Florida water, by the way, I have some at the back, if you're <laughs> curious. Um, and that was kind of that. And so I came out of it knowing, okay, you've, this is the thing that they've been talking about for thousands of years. That's what it feels like. Hmm. And right at that moment, Blue snapped a picture. So this is before, and this is right after. And uh, what I can tell you from looking at pictures of myself and knowing me is that that's my, if you've camped with me at Burning Man, that's my, the drugs have almost worn off. <laughs> face, but not totally, so shh, shh, well, okay, it happened again for a sec, all right, um, and so uh, that's basically my talk, um, there's really too much to get into to be able to condense it down uh, to 15 or 20 minutes, but what I will say is this, um, 
it is interesting to look beyond where Google or YouTube will take you. If you look up spirit possession or the voodoo tradition, frankly, you will find a lot of images that are um, essentially pretty racist. You'll hear kind of spooky sounding music and you'll see slow motion clips of people with their eyes bugging out in the back of their head with no context whatsoever. So for the purposes of this talk, I decided it was important to make sure we took some images of white people out of context and oohed and ah at them. So I hope you've enjoyed that. And just in case you were curious, Blue also took a picture of the, the during state. So if you want to know what it looked like, it was this. So with that, I'm, uh, I'm going to raise a glass to the endless mystery of human capacity and also um, very strongly to the ancestors who figured out how to do this weird thing, passed it on to us, and upon whose shoulders we stand. Folks, one more round of applause before we wind things up for this half. Um, we have a little project that I want to tell you about right before we go to break. We're building a map um, of our Adventure Harvey. Adventure Harvey is our, our tiny our tiny Wolpertinger friend. Uh, they're all created for us by one of the Odd Salon partners, Azolda. Um, they're all made by hand, and they're all different. And people have been taking with them on trips around the world for a, more than a year now. And uh, Harvey's been all over the place. This is a recent one from the Hill of Tara. Uh, this is the other night while we were doing uh, prep for tonight's salon at the, uh, the reading room at the San Francisco Li Public Library, the History Room, which is an amazing resource. Um, and I'm not exactly sure if somebody here took this picture. It was um, up on Instagram, but it's clearly a seasonally appropriate uh, debauch. So we're very pleased. Tonight we have, every uh, night we have custom Harveys that have been created for us. And tonight we have a little uh, spooky quorum of witch Harveys. So if you'd like to get one of them, I think there are a few left. Um, you can grab them there. You can also find our glassware and patches and all of the other things over at Merch, along with discounted tickets for our next few salons. Everything that you get over there helps us keep doing this. Uh, we run really close to the line around here, so every patch and Harvey purchase really helps us keep going. When we come back, we will be having a story of the original Victorian Ghostbusters, founded in the 1860s and still in business to this day. Uh, the possession of the nuns of Laodun, so we'll see a different version of spirit possession uh, told, told in the second half. And finally, a look at those uh, crank Victorian spiritualists at the end of the night. So grab a cocktail, we'll take a little break, and we'll be back in a few minutes.